Good morning. My name's Tim, and uh, if I don't know you, nice to meet you. Uh, we, my wife and I, and a fantastic team of uh, people from this local church uh, are planting a, a new church called CFC South. We've just announced that we are officially launching weekly services. So our official launch is on August the 26th, which is less than two months away. It's really exciting. And um, we announced that publicly last week. And we're just really excited that God has brought a team together that doesn't just want to attend, but wants to serve and contribute towards um, reaching out to their neighbourhoods. Everyone in our church lives in the southern suburbs, except for us. Um, we still live in the west, but we're um, going to be moving down south. And because we believe that the local church, when it's local, when people are connecting in local communities, neighbourhoods, that they can reach out to family and friends with the love of God and don't just share with them, but can also invite them to come and be part of what God's doing, to hear the gospel, to experience Christian community, to experience the presence and power of God in worship, to actually belong in a small group and to be equipped and empowered to share the love of God in their everyday lives. And so we think that's good news for everyone, but it's also good news for all the neighbourhoods in Adelaide that we believe that a church like ours, we, we're praying that God will, through this church and through our church and through other family-centred churches, that there will be many, many more churches planted in all the regions of Adelaide. Do you agree that that's a good idea? Because there's, um, because there's fantastic riches. Our church the Christian Family Centre, we're not trying to recreate the will. We're trying to live out the kingdom of God through the pattern we read in the book of Acts about preaching the gospel with signs following and that the love of God is for all people and is good news for all people and the Holy Spirit wants to touch lives, redeem and transform um, individuals, communities, families for the sake of our city through individual churches. And so that's our vision. That's the vision of this church and um, we are so blessed to have a great team and also the support of uh, this church, the Christian Family Centre at Seton. We just um, we would like to invite you to come and be part of our launch, but it's going to be really busy. We're at the moment we're meeting at Hallett Cove Baptist Church, and we meet from four till five thirty um, every fortnight with our launch team, and then this will be our first big Sunday where we meet weekly. And you are invited to come along. However, with one caveat, we would love you as our sending Mother Church to come and actually help us on the day. Um, we are wanting to host, I reckon we'll be hosting a couple hundred people. We're going to have a lot of kids. And so we want to be able to look after people really well because how many people know that you just, we, it, it's not that great to get lost in a crowd, that we want to be able to look after those that come along and that are checking out our church for the first time. We want them to have a great experience and to be welcomed and, to have a, and, and that we can really, as our team, look after ministering to them. So we're going to have needs for sausage sizzle and ushers and car park, um, kids ministry, a whole range of areas. And so come along. But um, if you are coming along, mate, what would be fantastic is if you could grab the Connect card when you fill it out at the end of the service, say, we're we're interested in coming, but um, and we'd also love to help out. And then what will happen is uh, you'll be contacted and we'll let you know how you can contribute on the day. It might be a small area, it might be a large area, but we just uh, so appreciate everything uh, this church has done in supporting us and the vision of planting churches around our city. So um, I hope that many of us can be there for our first Sunday. Also, um, it was really exciting at the early service. I just extended a need. We have, um, on average, even in our pre-launch phase, we've got around 35 um, children in our church. And that's a really big kids ministry for a relatively small church. And um, it's a wonderful provision. We think God has given us these children that they are a gift from God and we want to disciple them. We want them to have a great experience of Christian community, but also a great experience of who Jesus is through teaching them about who Jesus is. And, um, and so what we need is we need to bolster our team. And so we're building a team, but what we're believing is just even in this congregation, there might be one, two or three uh, couples potentially or individuals that say, you know what? I'm not serving um, in kids' ministry at the local church here. I'm plugged in in the morning, but I'm free in the afternoons. And I'll come and give three months or six months to help bolster and support the Christian Family Centre South 
um, kids team. We have a fantastic team, but we're looking for some experienced, some wise, some mature people that can come and just support. Don't have to come to meetings, don't have to come early, but just come and support and be available to help our team as we get established. Because if we've got 35 now, who knows in six months' time how many kids we've got. And maybe you've got, you don't have heaps of time, but you've got a season, a small season where you can contribute. Please come and let um, me know if maybe that's you. After the early service, a couple came up and said, maybe that's us. And I think maybe in this room there's someone, you can't serve in kids ministry here, but you're available in the afternoons. Come and see us or let us know on your Connect card. Um, that'd be fantastic. Okay, I think that's enough about that. I'll get into preaching. This is a great series called Anchored, and it's all about, um, it's all based on Psalm 119. Psalm 119 is the passage of the Bible that if you quickly try to read your chapter a day, you get really depressed when you open it and you're like, wow, I'm really going to have to read a lot faster this week. And because it's the longest chapter of the Bible and it's the longest psalm in the Bible. Um, it has 176 verses divided into 22 sections or stanzas um, representing each uh, letter of the Hebrew alphabet. And it is a giant acrostic. There's a number of acrostic psalms, but this is the biggest one. And so each, each um, letter is represented by each stanza of the Hebrew alphabet. And each stanza, the first sentence of every line starts with the same letter. So eight lines with the same, starting with the same letter. So it's an amazing work of poetry, and um, it would have taken a long time to construct. I would like to give the person that wrote it credit, but I don't know who he or she is. So um, well done, whoever you are, the mysterious writer of Psalm 119. But it is an iconic passage that has shaped the, um, the Jewish and the Christian tradition, and it is really about... The focus of the psalm, it's like a prayer to Yahweh, the God of Israel, by someone who really, really delights in the law of God, that loves God's word and God's commandments and God's law. In fact, it starts by saying, blessed are those whose ways are blameless, who walk according to the law of God. And it basically goes on to paint the picture of a blessed life and saying, if you want to know what a blessed person is like, a blessed person, a prosperous person, a flourishing person is someone that loves God's law. In the start of the Psalms, Psalm 1, it actually paints a picture of a blessed person. And it also says in Psalm 1, the very first Psalm in the Bible, it says blessed um, is the person that delights in the law of God and meditates on it day and night. Right at the start, there's this theme. If you want to know what blessing is like, if you want to know what it means to be happy, if you want to know what it is to flourish, then here it is. Love law? What? Isn't law bad? I've sat through so many sermons where I have learned to associate law with works and requirements and rules and regulations and I don't know about you but when I start hearing about rules and regulations it's like when you're on a camp and it's the first session of camp and then the leader gets up and says all right I just have to read out all the rules and do you know what that means that means stop listening this is all the boring stuff that's going to curtail our fun and as a youth leader for many years, you know, you get up and you, you say the rules and you say, these are the rules. This is the curfew. Boys do not go in girls' dorms. That lasts about seven seconds. And then, you know, you lay out all the rules and you can just see the eyes glassing over it. For, for so long, we have associated law with the, the requirements that God puts on us that are not fair. So therefore, Jesus came so we would be free from rules and regulations. Well, I believe that a better way of seeing law, and law is not just the first five books of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. And those five books were referred to as the Torah, 
the books of the law, but also in the days of Jesus when people were looking back, they referred to the law as not just the Torah, but the whole of the Old Testament scriptures at times. And so law was less about rules and regulations and legislation and more like a careful instruction from a parent to a loved child. So when you think about law, when you think about the commands of God, when you th- in this passage, Psalm 119, the part I'm going to be looking at, it talks about law, commands, precepts. Think of it not as rules and regulations that God imposes to trip us up in an arbitrary fashion, but rather think of it as careful instruction from a loving parent to their beloved child. The law was not just for spiritual life, but for social, political, religious, and ethical life. And some people say, well, why are there all these weird commandments? Because in the Old Testament, there was very specific commandments about the sacrificial system and about the process for worship and the process for purifying and cleansing oneself before entering the presence of God. And so that is what the, that's the ceremonial aspect of the law. And that's a really good thing. And then there's a civil or a civic aspect to the law of God. And that is basically you as a people are living in a world without parliaments, without government, without the rule of law. How are you going to live with each other without killing each other? How are you going to live in a society where there's justice, where there's righteousness, where there's forgiveness? How are you going to live with one another in a way that doesn't violate? And so God, so so there's civil laws. It's basically laws about government. And then there's moral laws. And so when we think of the law of God, different laws have different purposes. Some are ceremonial, some are civil, and some are moral. But they are all good. They are all expression of God's character and God's heart for his people. So we should never diminish or talk down the law of God. For Jewish people, there was always an inextricable connection between God's law revealed in the Torah and God's word. And there's a connection between God's law and his character. God is who he is and he speaks in accordance with his character. You see, laws reflect character so much. Like there's always weird laws out there. In fact, I I read the other day that there's a law in Victoria apparently that men, it's illegal for men to wear strapless gowns in public in Victoria which amazed me. So it's like legal for men to go out in public in dresses, but you have to make sure it's not strapless, guys. Um, and there's, there's weird laws all around. You can't chew gum in Singapore. Um, it's illegal to kiss in a moving vehicle in Italy. Like there's all sorts of weird laws out there, right? And often we think that some laws are arbitrary, but generally speaking, law at its best reflects character. So in my family, we have some unwritten laws. So like I'll give you the Christmas example. These are the laws of the Lockins household, even though these have never been written down. First of all, we go to church in the morning. Not like some of other Christian heathens out there that forsake worshipping on... No, no. <laughs> but, but that's... We go to church in the morning. We open presents together in a circle, one at a time, starting with the youngest. Um... We eat lunch together and you dare not leave the table. It's like, imagine if you scoffed down this lunch that had taken 14 hours to prepare. And then you're like, I'm finished. Can I go play video games now? Yeah, that's not going to cut it in the Lockins household. No, you stay at the table. And then in our family, in a Lockins family Christmas, the men clean up after lunch. Because generally in the preparation, the men have been useless. Or playing backyard cricket, which also has its utility. Um, So men clean up, um, and it's a radical idea, I know. Um, But these are the laws that are unwritten, but they're still laws, and they reflect the values of my parents. Different families have different values. Some families don't have a law of attending church, or they don't have a law of the men cleaning up, or they don't have a law of even gift-giving. You see, the laws of God reflect God's character. Just have a look at verse 2 and 3. I think this reflects a lot about what God's word is all about. Verse 2 says, Blessed are those who keep his statutes and seek him with all of their hearts. 
You see, the law of God or his statutes or his precepts or his commands or his laws, these are all descriptors of the way God communicates with his people. Blessed are those who keep his statutes and seek him with all their heart. You see, the emphasis is not just about doing what God tells us to do, but it's about seeking him with all of our being. It's not just a dead activity. It's actually an activity of our soul, spirit, mind, flesh. That's the first thing. Then verse 3, it says, They do no wrong, but follow his ways. This is really interesting. They do no wrong, but follow his ways. You see, there's a lot of talk about keeping the law of God and keeping his precepts, precepts and obeying his commandments. And it says these blessed people that keep his statutes, they do no wrong, but follow his ways. Get this. What the psalmist is saying is when you obey God, you are keeping his ways. You are being like him. So it's like the Lockins household. Oh, yeah, we're keeping, if you come to my household at Christmas time, we're keeping in the way of the Lockinses. The same thing when you obey God. It's not just doing what God tells you to do, otherwise, you're being a very naughty boy. No, when I do what God asks me to do, I'm keeping in alignment with His ways. I am becoming more like Him. That is the goal of the law. The goal of the Word of God is that we become like Him, that He shines His character and His life on us. And that is why Jesus, when He came, when He preached on the, in the Sermon on the Mount, He did not come to abolish the law, but to fulfil it. And so we have to be very careful the way we think about the commands and the law of God, not as negative things, as positive things, but as things that sometimes we fail to live up to. Then, so how should we engage with God's word? Let's read from verse 9 um, to 16. How can a young person stay on the path of purity? By living in accordance with your word. I seek you with all of my heart. Everyone say seek. Do not let me stray from your commands. I have hidden your word in my heart. Everyone say hidden. hidden. That I might not sin against you. Praise be to you, Lord. Teach me your decrees. With my lips I recount. Can everyone say recount? All the laws that come from your mouth. I rejoice in following your statutes as one rejoices in great riches. Can everyone say rejoice? I meditate on your precepts. Everyone say meditate. And consider your ways. I delight in your decrees. I will not neglect your word. You see, some of these words, if anyone ever comes to you and says, I need spiritual advice, I need spiritual counsel. And if they say to you, well, the answer is to pray and read the Bible. And you think, great. Thanks a lot. Three years of Bible college and all this experience and all you're going to tell me is to open a book and read it. Great. Let me tell you. There is great value and wisdom and utility in reading the Bible. But what I read here in Psalm 119 is this Word of God that comes to us in a multiplicity of ways through 66 books in different forms of genre and in, through, through different authors, through different languages, that it is not just about being read, it is about engaging it with all of our senses. And so it's not just about reading it, it's about meditating on it. It's about repeating it in our mind, it's about grappling with the truth. It's about saying, do I believe that? Do I understand that? Do I understand not just what that means to me today, but do I understand what it meant in that ancient culture? Do I understand what the teachings of Jesus meant 2,000 years ago? Do I understand what this would mean to a woman in that culture? Do I, do, have I researched it? Do I meditate on it? But it's not just meditating, it's living in accordance with the Word, it's testing it, and it's actually trying to implement it. So it's when you read about healing the sick, it's actually saying, okay, I'm going to try to pray for people, and even if I've never seen anyone healed, I'm still going to pray for people. Or if, if I read about fasting, I'm not just going to say, well, that's really nice that Jesus fasted. Maybe God wants me to fast, because it's a spiritual discipline that we read about in the Bible. And so it's not just about meditating on it, it's about living in accordance with the Word. And maybe it's not just that, it's about seeking Him. Maybe it's about hiding his word in our heart. How do you hide God's word in your heart? I think that's repeating it and memorizing it in such a way that it becomes not peripheral, but it becomes central to who you are. And so it's not just about putting a verse behind the toilet door so when you go into the toilet, you read a scripture, even though that's a really great idea. But it's about getting the word on your heart 
So just like Jesus did, when you're tested, when you're pressured, it comes out because it's in you. Because when you're under pressure, what's on the inside comes out of you. And so the Word of God is hidden there. It might not be obvious for people to see when they look at you, but you're tested. You're, you're, you're being pressured and it comes out because there's a Scripture, there's a truth that you hold on to that you've memorised within. I wonder how many of us have meditated, have lived in accordance with the Word, have hidden His Word in our heart. Uh, when it talks about delight, I wonder, wonder when the last time was. You know, see, see when I teach people, we, when we used to have interns here, I, I'd teach them how to read the Bible and I'd say, when you read the Bible, they'd laugh at me because sometimes I'd just read the Bible and I'd say, oh, hallelujah, how good is that? And, and, and or I'd laugh and, and because I, I try to teach people how to engage with the Bible, not just to read it. Because sometimes you need to stop and start worshipping. Sometimes you need to listen to the Bible in your car. Sometimes you need to listen to music that speaks about the character of God and you get caught up in worship. We need to listen to less talkback radio or less other music. Not that other music's good, but we need to meditate on the ways of God. We need to delight in Him. And then it talks about... With my lips I recount all the Lord's laws that come from your mouth. What it's saying is the psalmist is saying, I have heard your word and then I reproduce those and recount those out of my mouth. So what does it mean? We speak it out. So the Bible is not to be boringly read. It's to be grappled with in a 360 degree way of relating where we receive and we respond and we work Timothy Keller says that we ought to work the truths of Scripture into our affections until they shape our lives, so they shape our loves, hopes, and imagination. And that's what Jesus did. I wonder for some of us whether God wants us to re engage with memorizing a passage of Scripture. I wonder in the last five years how many verses from the Bible you have memorized. Not when you were 12, not when you were three. My, um, Pastor Bill teaches my kids verses from the Bible in, when they're driving together on the way to school in the morning. And my daughter, you know, they learn scriptures at school. But let me tell you, you can actually meditate on the Word of God. You can identify, do I believe this? Am I willing for this to be a pillar and a foundation in my heart and my life? I, I've been thinking recently about what actually the Bible is. Some people say the Bible is a book. Some people say it's a collection of books. Some people say it's like a library. You know, this is, this is the, the way I've been reflecting on it this week. Some people use the Bible as a weapon. And they say, the Word of God says. Because how many people know it's got much more authority when you wave it in people's faces? The Word of God says. And what people mean when they say that sometimes is my interpretation of the verses that I really like is because we've got to be really careful when we use the Bible as a weapon that we're not exposing ourselves to all the areas where the word of God is probably speaking directly to us okay so now the word of God is like a sword it can cut through it can be effective but we need to be careful I think the word of God for you and I in how we engage with it should be seen as less of a weapon towards other people to make us feel more self-righteous and more about like you open the door to a new ecosystem. A new, it's like you open this door and you enter a rainforest with plants and trees and life and there's a river of life that you can drink from and there's a new way of seeing, there's a new way of smelling, there's a new way of experiencing, there's a new king and you're, you, you, you live in this ecosystem and you learn to interpret the ecosystem because there's different, there's different plants and there's different animals and you have to interpret it, you have to work, you have to wrestle with it but the more time you spend in it, the more you understand the atmosphere and the culture. And see, that's what I think the Bible is. It's when you read the book of Revelation or you read the book of Genesis, it's all connected, but there's diversity in it and you have to explore it. And it, the centralising theme of it is the king of the ecosystem, is ecosystem. And his name's Jesus. You see, we have to be very careful because each of us reads the Bible with our own sinful filter and our own sinful lens. And we will gravitate towards the parts of the Bible that we like that we can use against others. But you know what? I think as we meditate, as we open up, as we worship, God will open up the Scriptures to us more and more. So does it actually work? Yes and no. 
is my answer. Does the Bible actually work to guide us and help us? Yes and no. I'll explain why I say no. (laughs) Be good to your servant while I live that I may obey your word. Open my eyes that I may see wonderful things in your law. This is a really interesting scripture. Open my eyes that I may see wonderful things in your law. Do you know what that tells me? It tells me that there are wonderful things in the law of God that you will only see if your eyes are opened. Is the Bible, does it work in terms of being a help and a guide? Well, I think the Bible can help you, but only if you have eyes to reveal, to, to experience the truth of the Scriptures. Because there's some things in the Scriptures that don't appear to be good news. They don't appear to be for our good and for our flourishing. And we have to have our spiritual eyes open that we will trust God and his goodness for our lives. It goes on to say later in the passage, it talks about rulers and people being against us, scorning us, um, slandering us. Uh, The rulers sit, verse 23, and together slander me. Your servant will meditate on your decrees. Your statutes are my delight. They are my counsellors. So the law of God here is presented as a counsellor. That's a really good thing. So does the Bible help us in our practical lives? Yes. Does it counsel us? Yes. Does it give us direction? Yes. Is it good for us? Yes. But I think the scriptures are good for guiding us, good for giving us wisdom. A lot of non-Christians, they don't believe, they haven't placed their trust in Christ, but the Bible still provides incredible wisdom and advice. In fact, if you're a non-Christian or you're just checking out faith or you're just starting off the journey, you can read through the Bible and take great wisdom from it about relationships. You can read through the book of Proverbs and it will help you so much in your life. But let me tell you, the, the scriptures are good for guiding us, but they can't save us and you will not be able to save yourself by keeping to the Bible. There's lots of people that are more holy than you have tried and they have failed and they have failed and they have failed and this is when we read from a New Testament perspective this is the problem with the law the problem with the law is that we feel like failures in light of the character of God We feel like we're not worthy. We feel like I know where I want to be. I know where God wants me to be. And I'm down here and I can't become that which I'm not. I can't overcome. I can't become perfect. I can't become a righteous person. And so we become full of shame or guilt. Or the flip side of that is we become full of pride. And we say, God, I don't even want to know you. I, I can do it on my own. And so the Word of God is fantastic but it can't save us on its own unless we have our eyes opened spiritually. I'll say a little bit more. I think just one more thing on that. If you have, if you're going through hell, if you've lost everything, when others have failed you, when you've failed yourself, when God seems distant, the Bible has great resources for you. The Bible does work because there's empathy and there's sympathy for just about every situation you'll find yourself in, which is fantastic. My next point is this. How to stop from being a closed book. In verse 25, the psalmist says this. I am laid low in the dust. Preserve my life in accordance with your word. I gave an account of my ways and you answered me. Teach me your decrees. Cause me to understand the way of your precepts that I may meditate on your wonderful deeds. The psalmist opening up his life for examination is a powerful thing. He gives an honest account for his life and allowed for God's word to shine a light in. He is not unaware of his weakness and frailty. This is the posture of the psalmist approaching the word of God. God, I am lowly and I'm weak. Examine my life. I'm open to you. That's his posture. Get down low. God, I need you. Examine my life. Do you know what you do? Do you know what I do? Probably, most of us. 
Okay. Yep. Yeah. Okay. We're opening the Bible. Sorry. We're not Muslims, so it's not sacrilegious to put the holy text on the floor. Okay. Now, let us approach this ancient patriarchal text, shall we? And see what we agree with and what we disagree with. Yep. Okay. Yep. Yep, that's pretty helpful, but oh my goodness. How ridiculous is that? Yep, not doing that, not doing that. That's just ridiculous. Let me flip over until, yep, oh, I love this bit. That's really good. And what we do is, many of us look down on the Bible and we look for things we can scrutinise and the things we can't accept. The people of God, however, should tip that on its head, allowing the Bible to examine and scrutinise us, looking for the things in us that God can't accept. Well, God accepts everything because God is love. Rhubarb. There's a lot of things God doesn't accept. I mean, God loves us, but there's things in your life that he doesn't say, oh, gee, I love that. I love that thing about Nathan. He loves Nathan. But he doesn't love everything that Nathan does or says. Sorry, Nath. (laughs) God looks at me and he's like, he's my boy. I love him. But when he speaks to his wife like that, it makes me really mad. I mean, God's word is not something that we have the right to scrutinise from above. We need to come under it and allow God's word to scrutinise us. Oh, yes, I'm going to read and interpret the Bible. Maybe we need to allow the Bible to read and interpret us more and more. Verse 30 says, I have chosen the way of faithfulness. I have set my heart on your laws. Do you know what I think he's saying there? He's saying, my heart is set on being faithful to what your law says even before I know what it is. God, I'm going to seek to live out your ways and your truth and your word and your promptings in my life, even if I disagree with it and even if I don't know what it is now. Because you have a posture in your heart of saying, God, I want to seek and I want to obey you. Not on my terms, but on yours. Does God really change our heart? Or when we read the Bible, does he just change our behaviour? Does he just say you're being really naughty and you need to stop doing that bad thing? Find the verse that says you can't do this or find the verse that says you can't do that. I believe God's word, the purpose of God's word is not just to change our behaviour but to change our heart. Let's read together. Teach me, Lord, the way of your decrees, verse 33, that I may follow it to the end. Give me understanding so that I may keep your law and obey it with what? All my heart. Direct me in the path of your commands, for there I find delight. Turn my heart towards your statutes and not towards selfish gain. Turn my eyes from worthless things. Preserve my life according to your word. The solution to focusing our lives on worthless things and selfish living is for God to change our heart. This is what we need. Does God's word in and of itself, reading the Bible, does it change our heart? I don't think it does in and of itself. Unless God, through the Holy Spirit, does something not just to our thinking but to our heart. This is the miracle of Jesus coming to us. God's word, not just through his law, but God's ultimate and definitive word is Jesus Christ. And he became flesh, not just to lead us and guide us and to help us, but to redeem us and to give us a free and forgiven heart. That means that even if we fall, we will not fail. You see, when I was thinking about an example of this. Um, when Nikki and I got engaged, it became very quickly aware to us nearly 15 years ago, that we were going to have to move to Melbourne. I'd lived in Sydney all my life. 
And all my family was there, all my friends were there, my church that in my thinking, I'm thinking I'm going to live in this community for the rest of my life. And then all of a sudden, within a very short space of time, I realised not only are Nikki and I going to get married, but because of a work situation, she had to move either to Melbourne or to London. And so the answers were this, that we moved to Melbourne together, we moved to London together, or we just separate. And I tell you, I didn't want to separate. I wanted to get married quick. And that's what we did. That's the Christian way. And... Um, <laughs> And, uh, and, and, and I just said, Nikki, I reckon we, we want to get married. We just need to get married quicker and we're going to move to Melbourne together. She didn't have to bring it up. I brought it up because I wanted to because the desires of my heart had changed towards living in Melbourne. <laughs> I didn't want to live in Melbourne. Didn't know anyone in Melbourne, didn't have a church in Melbourne, didn't have a job in Melbourne, didn't have anything in Melbourne. But God had done something in my heart where my heart was stolen by a beautiful girl and my heart was no longer my own. And so the decision was easy. It was like, no, no, not only do I begrudgingly, am I willing to go to Melbourne? Like a boss taps him on the shoulder and say, hey, you know, we want you to move away from your family and friends to a different state where you'll have less money. You know, like it's, it's no, actually, I don't begrudgingly move to Melbourne. I want to move because of what had happened in my heart. You see, I think that's the difference that many of us that try to live good and holy lives, we try and we try and we try. But the miracle of Jesus is that He changes us. He comes to us on His terms when we've got nothing to give Him. And then we get to say, God, thank you that in my shame, in my disgrace, you loved me and you forgave me and, and, and you, you put dignity in my life and you called out to me by name and you've adopted me into your family and it's like I'm loved by God I'm a child of God and now I get to live for you for all my days and even if I stuff up you're still gonna love me and so my heart is changed and I want to live for you that is the see see the problem of your life is not your desires it's not your temptations it's not the orientations of your flesh the problem for all of us is the orientation of our heart is my heart is the center of my life for myself or is the center of my life for him because I realize that my life doesn't belong to me anymore that my life has been purchased by him, by the life and the death and the resurrection of Jesus. You see, in Romans chapter 5, it says that we have been made right in the sight of a holy God. We have been justified through faith. We have peace with God. So what that means is that in your heart, if you're trying to live a good and righteous or a holy life, Anything in your heart where you feel like I'm a failure, I'm, a, I'm defeated, right? God says to you, because of Christ, you have peace with God and therefore you can be at peace in your heart. And then it goes on to say a couple of verses later that we have the peace of God. And then it goes on to say that the love of God himself has been poured out into our hearts. Through the Spirit of God. And what that means is that, that, that God's love is in you at such a degree that He has changed your heart and He is changing the orientation of your heart to being for others and to being for Him and away from self. And sometimes you might not experience that or feel it or believe it, but it's the truth. Does God's Word really change your heart? Well, I think... God's Word does change your heart. God's Word is called Jesus. John 1.4, the Word became flesh. Jesus changes our hearts. And then we get to live out the Word of God and the law of God. Can I invite you to stand to your feet? The final bit of this scripture, it talks about freedom. Verse 45, I will walk about in freedom 
for I have sought out your precepts. I will speak of your statutes before kings and not be put to shame. For I delight in your commands because I love them. I reach out for your commands which I love that I may meditate on your decrees. I love that scripture. I will walk about in freedom for I have sought out your precepts. You see, obeying God brings freedom. And you are free so you can obey God. See, freedom is not the ability to do, say and act how you want. True freedom is living in such a way that you're not enslaved by anything. You want to be free? Work out who you can trust. You can't be free if you don't trust. You can't be free if you don't know who you need to follow. If you work out who you can trust and who you can follow, that's where true peace, pleasure and purpose come from. God wants you to walk free and to run in the ways of his commandments because he has set our heart free. The greatest gift that we have is freedom to receive. It's not freedom to do, it's freedom to receive. Like, there's nothing worse as a parent than having to hold down your kids to give them a needle or to give them medication. Like, it's horrible. Because what you're doing is, it's, it's for their benefit. And, and you're like, I'm so sorry that I have to do this. But it's for your benefit. You see, because of Christ, you are free to receive. You're free to receive the love of God. You're free to receive the forgiveness of God. And you're free to obey. It's actually really cool. And we don't have music because I like the quietness. Can I invite anyone in this room? When it, see, it's, yeah, no music. This is good. I want you to come out the front if God wants to, you to receive something freely in your life. You might be, want to receive salvation. You know, might need to receive forgiveness. You might need to receive the truth of God's word. A truth about not being condemned. A truth about not being enslaved. A truth about the fact that you are loved and chosen by God. The truth that there's a purposefulness to your life. Whatever it is, if you need to receive something, I want you to come down the front right now. I'm just going to pray a blessing. We're not going to be long. I also, if God is speaking to you about entering a new level, come out now, right now. If God is speaking to you about a new level of engaging with the Bible, about not just reading the Bible from afar, but about diving in and experiencing his word for your life, about it becoming a meditation of your heart, you come now. We're just going to pray for you. For some of us here, we've been cutting and pasting and picking and choosing the bits of the Bible that we like. And God is saying to you, I want you to trust me with your whole life. You come now. I just want to pray for you. Come out now. Thank you, Lord. We love you, Lord. We love you. We thank you that you are faithful. You keep on coming now. We're just going to have a moment of prayer before we close the service. If you just want to say, God, I don't just want what you can do for me. I want to become more like you. Shape me with your word. If there's anyone else, come out the front. Maybe you've been trying to change your behavior. You've been trying to change your habits. But God is saying, you know what? You've been trying, but you haven't been receiving. You've been straining. But I want to know that you are equipped by me. You can train, but you don't have to strain anymore. That I will give you what you need. Thank you, Lord. I think some of us here, we've been a closed book. We've been reading the Bible at arm's length. And maybe the prayer for us this morning is the prayer from Psalm 139. Search me, O oh God, and know my thoughts. If you'd like prayer for just God to search your heart, just to kind of do an audit of your heart. You've been attending church, you've been singing songs, but your mind's been a million miles away. You come now. Thank you, Lord. I just invite the um, pastors and prayer team to come and just lay hands on people just regarding these areas and just join with them. And in your heart, you just pray and you say, God, I receive your truth. I receive your word in my life. I receive your promises. I receive your love. 
Father, I just pray for all of us here. Why don't we right across this room, just raise our hands as a sign of openness. You might want to open your palms. Father, I just thank you that we have been created to be your children and that we will never find rest or pleasure for our souls until we find our identity in you. Thank you for all of us in this room that even if we're just starting our journey of faith or even we've been Christians for many, many years, that you want to bring us home to you so that we can unlock the mysteries of our life, that that we can unlock the mystery of who we are called to be, that we find our identity not through digging deep within ourselves, but through trusting that you know us better than we know ourselves. I thank you that when your word comes to us, it is not to crush us and it is not to shame us, but it is to bring life and love and liberty. Thank you, Lord. I just thank you that we are justified through faith, by grace, through faith. And I thank you that we have the peace of God in our hearts. And I thank you as well that the love of God has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit. Thank you, Lord. I also thank you that there's freedom coming. Freedom not just to do what we want, but freedom to say yes to those things that would help us to overcome slavery. Freedom to those things that would bring life. Freedom to those things that will allow us to run in the path that you have for us. Freedom to not be bound by boredom, bound by conformity, bound by doubt, bound by deception, that we will be free to serve the living God forever and ever. Amen.